let me pull up ah yes ma'am um <laughs> those that scares me every single time um perfect can you see my screen you're all set to go amazing um so yes hello everyone my name's jada um as was just mentioned um i am a shark scientist and i'm gonna kind of walk you through how I got to where I am and some of the hats, pun intended, that I currently wear and all the fun things that I do um, for work and for fun. Um, so to start, we're going to go through a little bit of my journey. Believe it or not, I grew up in the middle of the desert. Um, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and before that, I lived in Illinois. So I've lived in completely landlocked states my entire life um, until I then moved to a coastline. Um, but I had a lot of fun living in the desert. I got to explore a lot of really cool animals, looking at super awesome reptiles. Um, when I was in undergrad, I went to Northern Arizona University. We did like bat netting field trips. Um, and I learned a lot about just animals in general. So my degree um, out of college was just biology, not marine biology, not ocean science, just biology. Um, and it got me where I needed to go. So I thought it was a great degree. Um, while I was in undergrad, for one summer, I did an internship at an aquarium in Scottsdale, Arizona. So this is a spotted eagle ray. That's me feeding it. All of my responsibilities were like feeding and doing like water quality checks to make sure that certain levels of certain uh, like chemicals weren't too high and things like that. Um, I got to feed the animals. I got to clean their tanks um, and I got to work with anything that had gills and also the sea turtles. Um, so that was really cool. I got to work with tons of different species of rays and sharks and bony fish, both in freshwater and in saltwater. Um, and it was a, it was a ton of fun. Um, after I graduated from college, I went to Friday Harbor Labs, which is out in Washington. It's like a little island, um, honestly closer to Canada than it is to Seattle, I think. Um, so it's pretty far up there. It gets kind of cold sometimes, but I had a ton of fun there and I was working on skates. Um, I don't have a picture of a skate, but if you picture a stingray, they look very similar. Um, and this is one of their egg cases. So I was looking at their egg cases and looking at different properties of like, they have these really fine textures on them. And depending on the species, those textures on the egg cases can be totally different. Some of them are super smooth. Some of them have like these weird, like hair-like projections on them. Super weird. And so I was looking at if uh, those weird textures that differ by species, if they had anything to do with how well the, uh, the egg case like stuck to the sand. Um, and we're not exactly sure what purpose they serve still. So there's still a lot of research to be done around skate egg cases. Um, but that was some really cool stuff. I got to use some really cool technology, like a scanning electron microscope, which was this really big old machine that I was terrified of because I didn't want to break it. Um, and in order to use it, you had to like dry out your specimens using this other really old machine. And they were like, be careful. If you do it wrong, it'll explode. And I was like, this is terrifying. Um, it didn't explode. So everything was fine. <laughs> Um, after that, I did a job. I, I worked as a, a lab technician. That was my job. And so I basically organized the chemicals and I helped some of the undergrads with their projects. Um, they flew me back to Friday Harbor Labs to do like some CAT scanning or CT scanning on some really small fish. Um, and then I got to use those CT scans and like pick out certain bones from the scans and then 3D print those bones, which was super cool. In this picture, what I was doing is clear and staining some fetal sharks. Basically what that means is you dye all of the bones and the cartilage blue and red, except sharks don't have bones. So the things that you dye blue are like calcified cartilage, which kind of feels like bone, but it's a little bit different. Um, and then you basically clear, you turn all the muscles clear. So all you can see is like the skeleton. It was super cool. Unfortunately, the pandemic hit. So I got to stain these sharks and turn them completely blue. And then I had to disappear and I never got to go back and finish clear and staining those sharks. So there's just a bunch of blue sharks sitting in a lab somewhere in DC. I think that's kind of funny. Um, maybe that'll be my legacy in DC. I don't know. Um, and then after that, starting in the year 2020, which was a very weird year to start graduate school, I went to get a master's degree at the University of Washington. 
Um, however, I never actually got the master's degree because then my advisor was like, hey, I'm actually moving to the other side of the country to go to Woods Hole. Do you want to keep being my student and do you want to come with me? And I was like, sure. So then I transferred and now I'm over here on this side of the country. I'm in Massachusetts. I live on Cape Cod. If any of you have ever heard of it or ever been there, um, it's really cool, but the winters are really cold because again, I'm from the desert. Um, but this is a picture of me doing some field work out um, in the Atlantic Ocean, which is not something that I had done very much of before coming here. Um, I was holding a water sample from this sea that we were in. We were in the Gulf Stream, which is like a big current that goes up uh, the side of uh, the east coast of the United States. Um, and we were out there tagging whale sharks, which is why I'm wearing whale shark pants. Um, and what's crazy about this picture is we were like a hundred miles from the coast. Um, so uh, this was like my first first time going so far away from land that I couldn't even see land for like three whole days. We had no cell service. There was nothing out there except for blue water and then a bunch of animals whenever, you know, they decided to pop up. It was super, super cool. Um, but that's kind of how I got to where I am now. Um, I'm here in Massachusetts, hanging out, doing research. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about my research. So this is a photo of me trying to put a tag on a whale shark which was wild. They are huge. Like even now it's hard for me to really understand how big they are. And I've seen them in person. They can get to be up to like 40 feet long. The largest one ever seen was 61 feet long, which is ridiculous to think about. That's like a bus. Um, and so what I look at specifically is shark migration. So I do study um, at the moment, the two largest fish species on the planet, which are the whale shark and the basking shark. So in order to do that, I do some modeling. Now, this picture is a little weird, um, but basically this is like, they call it a, a species distribution model. And it's basically just like the darker colors are where you're more likely to see a certain species for this specific model. It's the dusky shark, which is this shark that's right here. Um, so it's where in its habitat you're most likely to see it. Um, and that can depend on, you can use different data to get that. You can look at different sightings of where people have reported where they've seen that species. Um, you can use tagging data of, we tagged this animal and now we know that they're in whatever place. You can then look at like environmental parameters, like the water temperature um, or time of year, things like that to tell when you might be able to see um, these sharks. So this is looking specifically at in fall, um, where are you most likely to see a dusky shark? And I'm planning on doing something similar um, with basking sharks. Um, like I said, we also do tagging. This was a tag that I put on uh, the whale shark. And you notice how tiny the tag looks compared to its fin. The tag is bigger than my cell phone. So not a ton bigger, but it's bigger than my cell phone. So to know that there's something a bit bigger than a cell phone and it looks that tiny compared to the animal is like weird to me. Um, but this tagging can tell you a lot of different stuff. There are many different types of tags. Um, this tag is what we call like a biologger tag and it has a ton of different data channels like an accelerometer and a magnetometer, which are very complicated data that you get at really, really high resolutions, like 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 16 or more data points per second, potentially. Um, you can also have like depth information and temperature and like light levels. It's a very complex tag, but they're super, super useful to tell you what kinds of potentially like behaviors the animals are doing, like how they're swimming, um, how fast are they kicking their tails and stuff like that. Um, there are satellite tags that can transmit data to you through the satellites. Um, and those can give you um, also some of the same data, um, like depth and temperature. And sometimes they can give you specific like points where the animal was. Um, so like a geolocation, um, almost like a GPS of like the tag was right here and it was on the animal. We know that the animal was in the Bahamas. I don't know. Um, and so that's really cool and very interesting stuff. So that's some of the data that I'm able to collect and learn more about where are they migrating and why are they migrating? And when they're in certain areas, how are they behaving? Tagging is really helpful with that. But my research also uses drones, which I have not yet gotten the chance to fly, but I'm very excited about. Um, basically what I'm gonna do is fly a drone above an animal and take pictures 
pictures of it. And then we can try and get estimates of how long the animal is, how wide the animal is. Um, and those measurements can kind of tell us like, are they eating a bunch? Um, are they behaving in a certain way? Are they, uh, you know, are there any, or can we identify like feeding behaviors while they're in a certain area? Um, and so drones can tell you a bunch of different things through like pictures and videos. Um, and so I'm really excited to be using drones as well. And so just for an example, um, drones have also been used on whales too. So this is a really cool um, study that someone did basically looking at how the length of right whales have changed over time. So you can see these like dashed lines around the whales are like how big you would expect the whale to be at a certain age versus the size of the actual whale. And they were able to get all of this just by taking pictures of the animals from the sky. Um, and that's super, super cool stuff. And I figured, hey, why can't we do the same thing on sharks? Um, so that is going to be one of the, the goals of some of my research. So that, for the most part, is the research that I'm doing. I do a lot of tagging down in Florida, too, with my nonprofit, Minorities in Shark Sciences, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, but I also do a lot of, oh, wait, just kidding. I forgot about this slide. Let me tell you why all of this matters first. Um, conservation is super important. I'm sure you guys have heard that word before, um, talking about protecting the animals that we have um, because they're important to our ecosystems. So I think it's really under it's it's really important to understand um, what places are really important to the sharks, what places are giving them the resources they need. Um, if they need to eat a lot, before they migrate really, really far distances. Like for example, basking sharks that are on Cape Cod can travel over 17,000 kilometers down to like the Caribbean, which is so cool. But that's like the marathon of all marathons. You have to be able to fuel that somehow. Um, so maybe there's a place that's really important for them for fueling up for the migration or maybe recovering from the migration to be able to eat a lot so they can regain their energy before or maybe after those migrations. Um, so it's really important to understand what places are important for the sharks and how those places and those resources are gonna change with climate change. Um, because there's a lot happening with the ocean right now. We're putting a lot of CO2 into the ocean, which is not great. Um, and the warming temperatures and the acidification, all of it is kind of changing the way that animals behave and, and the timing that they do things. So sometimes, uh, like they're like, for example, the basking sharks, sometimes their copepod prey is more abundant earlier than it should be, or maybe later than it should be. Um, but if these guys are still migrating on the, at like the same time every year, then that might be a problem that they're not able to get access to the food that they need in order to migrate. So it's important to understand how all of this stuff is going to be affected by climate change. So we can understand how to better protect these species. Um, and also they just, you know, they deserve to be here. They've evolved over millions of years. Sharks have been around for over uh, around 450 million years. They've been around longer than trees. They've been around longer than the rings of Saturn. Like that's a long time. And so I think that it's important to remember that evolution has created them to be so well fit for this environment. And so they deserve to be able to stick around. Um, so it's important to try and conserve them. But as I was going to say before, I do a lot of science communication as well, because I think science is really cool. I like talking to people about science. Um, and it also, I think, is really important to just have a really well-educated public. Um, learning more about science, I think, is really helpful when it comes to conservation and maybe when people in government are making policy decisions, too. Um, because how can you expect people to make decisions about something if they don't know about it? Uh, so just teaching people, hey, here's this cool animal. Here's where it lives. Here's how big it gets. Um, it's endangered. We should help it by doing X, Y, Z, whatever things. Um, I think all of that is really important to do. And also, like I said, it's just a lot of fun for me. So I do a lot of that on social media. And I have a video here of a TikTok that I've made. Um, and I will show that to you guys if you can't hear the sound just like let me know hey the friends back we're gonna back talk about the angular rup shark it's a very specific name for a very specific looking shark they can get to be around five feet long but they usually don't get larger than like three and a half feet small friend 
they usually like to chill near the sea floor, you know, just kind of hanging out, being adorable little goons. And while they're down there gliding, they look for snacks that are hiding, specifically benthic snacks like worms and crustaceans. Not on board with the worms, but I could go for some crab legs. Now I got some bad news. They may or may not be endangered. And by that, I mean, they are. They, they are indeed endangered. <laughs> Sometimes they get caught as bycatch in fisheries, and that's very sad to hear. I mean, just look at his face. He doesn't look too thrilled about it either. But here's a reminder that science and conservation are very important. But let's address the elephant in the room. Why do they look like this, you may ask? Because they're friend-shaped. But much like other wildlife, I get the feeling that they're the type of friend that values their personal space, so please don't hug them. But seriously, their dorsal fins are so specifically shaped, and their second dorsal fin is pretty darn big compared to body size. Also, they don't have an anal fin. What? A kooky girdle adds crustacean wrangler. You think he's round? Yeah, right. Triangular. So there you go. There you go. There's some of my, uh, some of my science communication. Um, I like to do some like fun, fast paced, goofy comedy type of science communication. Um, and I've recently started some like new series of things that I'm posting. So like fish that have weird names, the video that I posted most recently on that one was there's a fish whose scientific name is called boops, boops, which translates basically to like cow eyes because they have like really big eyes. Um, and I just think that that is the funniest name. I'm doing another one uh, on a fish that's called the sarcastic fringe head. Like there's so many weird fish names out there. Um, and then I'm also doing a series on like, if this fish were like in a parallel universe, what would this fish be? Um, and the one I just did was there's a mud skipper. Um, that's a very cool fish. They spend a lot of their time out of the water, but they seem more like salamanders than fish, but they're fish. And so I said it in a parallel universe, this guy would be a salamander. Um, and so I just, you know, some kooky little videos um, with some fun little comparisons and jokes and whatnot. Um, so yeah, that's some of my my social media science communication. Um, let's see if I can get this to go to the next slide without playing again. Okay. Um, I've also done some stuff on YouTube. Uh, so I've worked with BBC Earth a couple times now. Um, I did a video called Seven Superpowered Sharks where I wrote a script and I filmed a video in front of a green screen. And then they took that video and they edited me in front of a bunch of sharks. Um, and it was so much fun to be able to do that and to be able to have the creative control also to be able to write the script um, and to kind of see that now just like on the BBC YouTube channel um, is super cool. It's like a dream come true because I grew up watching like BBC and like planet earth and blue planet, all those things. And so now I get to, to, I guess, be a character in their story as well. Um, and I've done a couple other series. There's a kids series on, I think it's, I think it's on the BBC kids YouTube channel, um, called first chance to see where it's looking at, um, baby animals of endangered species. Um, and then we talk to like some zookeepers and stuff. And so that's really fun. And then there's another one called into the deep where we talk about some really cool science happening around the world. Um, we talked about like squid communication in the deep sea. And we talked about like robots and different technology that we can use to study animals. Um, and so that was a really fun series as well. I got to kind of do some zoom interviews and also some in-person interviews with some really awesome scientists around the country. Um, I've also been on TV, which all also was a huge dream come true. I grew up watching like Discovery Channel and National Geographic and Animal Planet. And I got to be featured on Nat Geo's Shark Fest talking about sharks in, uh, they call it the mesopelagic zone or the ocean twilight zone. Um, basically it's like 200 to about a thousand meters deep in the ocean. It's just like this area where there's not much light anymore. Um, and some sometimes sharks go down there um, and we think that it's probably to eat food, but we're not totally sure. There's still more to be done on that. Um, but I got to talk about it on TV and also get this terrible screenshot of my face on TV. This was the worst time to pause it, but whatever. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was a ton of fun. Um, also a dream come true. Like I said, I kind of grew up watching like Shark Week and stuff like that. And so to be on Nat Geo's Shark Fest was amazing. Um, and I've done some like live shows as well some like in-person stuff in New York I'd love to do more of that I think it's really fun to physically be able to be there and like interact with an audience and just really get people excited about science um but I also am able to get people excited about science through my nonprofit organization which is minorities and shark sciences um this is an organization dedicated to supporting 
gender minorities of color in the field of shark science. Um, so we have a lot of um, women of color. We have some really awesome non-binary members as well. Um, there are four co-founders uh, and I will point them out. If you can see my mouse, there's me right here, Carly Jackson Bohannon, Amani Weber Schultz, and then Jasmine Graham over here. And we started all of this in the middle of the pandemic. It was June of 2020 when we launched this organization. And we basically just said, we want to see representation in science. Uh, we want to make a community for people that uh, that look like us, that experience similar things as us, that are excited about science like us. So we started this organization. And now we have around 400 members in, I think, 40 different countries around the world or close to 40, which is wild in just three years that we've been able to do that. Um, but it's a really, really nice uh, organization to kind of have that community. And we have um, we have a lot of opportunities for people as well, um, like shark tagging workshops. We've got summer camps and spring break camps and we've got internships and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, so yeah, I think for um, most of our opportunities are for people 18 and older. Um, however, we do have some opportunities for some younger, uh, some younger audiences as well. So if that's something that you're interested in, um, you should check out our website, which I have, I think of like a link to or whatever later. Um, but then this is just a photo of some of our members. So you can just see all these amazing, wonderful, diverse faces. Um, and I think that it's really important because I, as a kid, didn't really see myself in the roles that I wanted to be in when I was growing up. Um, I loved like Steve Irwin and Jeff Corwin, and those guys are awesome and they're great. Um, but I also would have liked to see someone that looked like me. And so now we're able to have this amazing group of people um, that can be that representation for younger audiences and also, um, you know, they are doing such amazing science. And so it's great to be able to highlight them as well and be like, look at all the amazing things that are happening um, and that our members are doing. So just a fun picture of all the diverse faces that we have in our, our membership. Um, and then just a couple of fun pictures of doing science-y things. So this was during my time at the aquarium. Um, this is me feeding the cow nose rays. This was me underwater with the cow nose rays. Again, me feeding the eagle rays. And then there's me, I was cleaning the leopard shark exhibit. So I thought that that was kind of fun. And they got a picture of me from the outside of the exhibit. Um, and then this is me doing a bunch of field work. So we've got a nurse shark, a black nose shark, a bonnet head shark. This one's a blue shark. That one's a mako. Yeah, that one's a mako shark. Um, this is a Chilean devil ray, and then we've got a whale shark over here. So I've seen so many different species in my time. This doesn't even cover half of them, um, but all of my field work is so exciting, and I get to like really experience what these animals' environment looks like, what they do, kind of just observe them in their natural habitat, um, and sometimes I get to put tags on them and see where they're going, and that's really cool too. So with all of that, um, I hope I didn't throw too much information at you, but I'm happy to take any questions. If you guys are on social media, um, feel free to follow me. If you are not, that's also fine, obviously. Um, and then also there's the the Minorities and Shark Sciences social media and uh, website as well. If you guys are interested in checking anything out over there. Um, and with that, I'll happily take any questions. Oh, thank you, Jada. That is so cool. Um, so everyone's giving a silent applause, I am sure. Um, we're already getting some good questions in the chat, but the first one that I got a couple of, oh yes, good uh, shark hat change, uh, is shark change. concern over your uh, your safety when doing this. How do you make sure you're not getting hurt when you're tagging sharks uh, and what are, yeah, safety precautions around that? Yeah, so we always make sure that um, if we are handling sharks, we wanna make sure that we are handling them in a way that it's safe for them and also for us. So we want to make sure that, you know, obviously the sharks don't necessarily enjoy being handled. The smaller ones especially um, are pretty feisty because the smaller you are, the more likely you are to perceive literally anything as a threat. So the small ones are like really bendy because again, they don't have bones. Their whole skeleton is made of cartilage. They're very bendy. They'll whip around. They can, a lot of them can bite their own tails. Um, and so usually what we do is we have someone kind of grab just behind their gills. We don't want to like 
crush their gills or anything because that's how they breathe. Those are very important structures. So we kind of grab just behind their gills and their tails and we support their stomachs because they don't have like a rib cage or anything and they don't typically experience gravity. So we have to make sure that we're supporting their organs as well. So we have to hold their, um, let's see. Yeah, this one's a really good picture of that. So just behind the gills, we got the tail support underneath the tummy as well. Um, and we always have, you know, multiple people paying attention. We've got one person always like, if it's a larger shark, we have them kind of like on what we call like the mid body of the shark. We can feel if they're starting to tense up and if they're starting to tense up, it's kind of just like, don't do anything. No work is being done. Don't try to draw blood. Don't try to tag it. Nothing. Just wait for it to calm down. Um, and we also, you can see in this picture, we have a hose in the shark's mouth to make sure that it can still breathe. It's not like suffocating when it's out of the water. We want to make sure they can still breathe so they don't get stressed out. Um, and it's just kind of, there's a lot of, you just have to have the awareness of even if you're not on the pointy end of the shark, um, the tail can still be, it can still end up being the pointy end because sharks can whip around and bite their own tails sometimes if they really wanted to. So just being aware that it is a wild animal. Um, you're doing this for research. You want to be as very, you want to be as careful as you can um, to, to protect them and to protect yourself. So just the awareness of where's the head at? We want to make sure that the tail's not going to like whip us in the face. That has definitely happened before. Um, you end up getting shark burn, which is sounds fake, but it's like road rash, but from a shark because their skin is like sandpaper. It's like their scales are basically made of modified teeth. Uh, so I like to say they have skin teeth. It's very weird, um, but you can definitely get shark burn from it and you have to make sure you clean it really well. Otherwise you can get like a, a pretty nasty infection. Um, oh, also quick correction. Sorry. I, you don't grab behind the gills. You grab just in front of the gills and like the, the jaw, you kind of like hold the jaw. Um, so that's kind of the way we do it. It takes a lot of training. I I've never done that. I've never been on the head of the shark. I'm usually on the tail. Um, just because I haven't done as much tagging as, as like Amani, for example. So, um, when I say all of this, this is for education purposes, please don't go out and try to do any of that. <laughs> That is so great. Um, so fascinating. I've never really thought about how to hold that big shark safely. Um, we're getting a ton of amazing questions. Uh, I think this kind of lends into the another one, which sounds like some folks are interested in getting involved in any way. Do you know of any uh, weight places people can research or, you know, look into learn learning more, any community science projects? Is there anything that you know about ways that they can get involved? That's a great question. I think that... In my personal experience, the best way for me personally to have gotten involved was to to do some work at my local aquarium, which is why I did that internship. Um, I think that I don't like unpaid internships. I think if you're working, you should be getting paid for it. That being said, my internship was unpaid um, because I could afford to to do an unpaid internship and not everyone has that luxury and I totally understand that which is one of the reasons why we started MISS and we wanted to create these opportunities um, that were of no cost to the members and the per the people who wanted to participate um, so I would say um, sorry remind me the age group again um, we're on average talking to about middle schooler age okay that's what history. I thought just wanted to double check um, I would say yeah if you can maybe do like a like a volunteer for a couple days at like an aquarium or a zoo to maybe kind of help talk to some of the guests about animals. I'm not sure what age you have to be for that. I think it probably depends on the area. Um, but if I would say look for any potential programs or like summer camps or anything that they might have with like a zoo or aquarium um, for this age group, I think would be a really good place to start looking. Um, and maybe in your specific area, if you were to go to an aquarium and just be like, hey, what kind of opportunities do you have for someone like me? Um, they might have a better idea um, just because I, I am not in the same place as you necessarily, but um, they might have some pretty good ideas for you as well. So reaching out to a zoo or aquarium, I think is a really good place to start. That's great. I, and I got a DM saying that some folks are maybe a little older than that. And that's great. That means probably you maybe Perfect. have even more opportunities accessible to you. Um, great. Moving along. So it sounds like people are uh, interested in the amount of time that you spend on the ocean itself. 
how much of you, yeah, how much field time do you actually get? That's a really good question. And I think that that most people have like a pretty skewed idea of like what science is and that it's like all in the field. No, I spend probably 10% of my time in the field. It's really not a lot. That time is very valuable to me and I love it so much. Um, but it's not a lot. Like this summer, I didn't get to go out in the field and that was for a lot of different reasons. There was like the boat broke down and had to be fixed. And then once it was fixed, there was a hurricane coming through. So then we surely couldn't go offshore and all this stuff. Um, so I didn't really get to do much field work over the summer this year, um, which is usually our field season because in the winter, the sharks disappear and they migrate somewhere much warmer. Um, but I, I go out, most of my field work happens in the summer or like this, the late spring or like early fall kind of area. And then the rest of the year, I'm basically analyzing all that data that I had just collected. So if that's data from like the biologers with like the accelerometer data, I'm going through and I'm like making figures, um, figuring out like, what do these patterns mean? Um, figuring out like, where did the sharks go and how long did it take them to get there? Um, what resources are there? Like, are they potentially feeding in these areas? That kind of stuff. So um, yeah, it's not a ton of time in the field. The time in the field is very fun, but it's a lot of like computer time and a lot of like coding. Um, but that stuff is also really exciting because then you get to see what kinds of patterns these sharks that you got to see in person, what are those sharks doing now when you're not around? Um, and sometimes when you find something really cool, you're like, I'm now the only person in the world that knows this exact information. And that's really cool. So for a couple minutes, you're like, I know something you don't know. And then you get to go and tell like the rest of your lab or your advisor, like, hey, I found this really cool thing. Like, let's talk about it. What does this all mean? Um, and then I feel like it's kind of putting together pieces of the puzzle of what do these sharks do? How do these animals exist in our crazy huge ocean? Um, and so even though it's not field work and you're not actually in the water or like on a boat. Um, I think that the, the data analysis side of it can also be pretty interesting too, especially if you like coding. Um, I have a love or hate relationship with coding. Sometimes I'm like, I can't get my code to work. I don't feel smart. And then once you get it to work, you're like, oh, I'm a genius and no one, no one can touch me. I'm amazing. Um, very, very highs and lows with coding for me personally. <laughs> um, but yeah. That's awesome. That's great. Okay. Some fun shark fact, fast questions for you. Um, is it true and how far can sharks smell or sense blood? Is there an average range or is it species dependent? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know how, well, okay. <clears throat> this, this whole idea of like, they can smell a drop of blood from like a mile away. Shark noses work in a similar way to ours in that like we have to have like a, a particle of what we're smelling like in our nose um, for the receptors to like respond and be like, oh, I can smell this thing. Like, uh, so if a shark doesn't have like a particle of the blood in its nose, it's not going to be able to smell it. It won't register. It's not going to be like, I sense that there's blood five miles that way. Like, that's not how that works. Um so there needs to be like, I mean, they have a very good sense of smell. So you think of like a bloodhound, like can smell things that like we can't even begin to imagine. And like, you know, there are like police dogs that can like smell drugs from however far away and whatever. So um, they can definitely smell a lot better than we can, um, to my understanding. But they it's it's not some like magical, like sixth sense for blood that they have. Um I'm not sure exactly what the distance is, but they have to have at least a particle of it in their nose. So I guess maybe it depends more on like how far that particle has traveled. Um, I'd have to do a little bit more research on that. I'm not super like well-versed in like shark smelling necessarily. Um, but yeah, it's not like this all magical sense for blood. Um, and also I feel like there's this myth of like, if you have like a small cut, don't go in the ocean because the sharks are going to sense it. Um, also not true. They're not, they don't eat people. They're not like evolved to, to recognize our blood as like a prey source. 
They're mostly going after fish or crustaceans. Some of them go after marine mammals, but we're not any of those things. So if, if they're smelling blood of humans and they're also smelling blood of like tuna, they're probably going to go after the tuna because they're like, I know what that is. Um, so, you know, just throw that out there too. I think that's probably very comforting to some people. Um, and also, I apologize for any background construction noise. It started quite literally right when this uh, presentation happened, so I apologize. Um, but some other fast questions is, do sharks lose their teeth? Yes. Oh, my gosh. I love this question. Okay. Sharks lose their teeth um, at, I think, different rates, depending on the species. Um, but they can lose, depending on the species, between like thirty to 40,000 teeth in a lifetime. Um their teeth are just consistently moving out on that conveyor belt. Look at ooh, perfect example. So they've got like these couple rows of teeth and this one will fall out and then one will move into place and it just continues and continues. Um, and, you know, actually I have a bunch of shark teeth, um, including a megalodon tooth that I figured maybe I would show really fast. Oh my um, gosh. The, meg the, the largest megalodon tooth ever found was around 10 inches. This one's about four and a half five inches long which is wild so there's a tooth out there twice as big as this how that is ridiculous um they're able to kind of estimate how how big sharks are based or how big prehistoric sharks are based on um like the anatomy and sizes of the sharks that we have now um and also the size of their teeth um based on where do we think this sat in the shark's mouth um, did it sit all the way back here? Did it sit towards the front? The ones at the front are typically bigger. Um, anyway, yes, yeah, sharks do lose their teeth uh, constantly throughout their life. And different sharks have different shaped teeth for different purposes. Um, and so you've got like, this is, this might be hard to see, but this is a sandbar shark tooth. You can see it's little tiny serrations on the sides. That's perfect for like tearing um, and like ripping through things. Then there's, this one's a lemon shark tooth and it doesn't really have those serrations. That's probably better for like puncturing than it is for like ripping and tearing. Um, and then you also see, uh, I have in here a ray tooth, which is that like bar right there, which is perfect for just like crushing things because they eat like invertebrates. So like clams and crabs and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, that's my little shark tooth lesson. I hope that was interesting. <laughs> That is fascinating. And so cool to see that they evolved with the sharks. I like that. Okay. I have two questions I really want to ask. One's super fast and we can keep the other one uh, speedy, hopefully, to get you out on time. But somebody asked a great question, which is how uh, we can save populations and get involved. Are there any quick things or little things that we can do to help save populations? That's a sure. big question oh. that I'm putting you on the time crunch for. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's okay. I think that a great way to help the sharks is to kind of focus on ways that you can help the ocean as well. Um, well, and also science communication, because again, you can't expect people to like do something if they don't really know about it. So if you wanted to do some form of science communication, like start like a, a group of students that wanted to get together and just like talk about like recent events and like recent science, um, that would be really cool if you wanted to make like flyers and posters to like pin around your school if they allow you to do that you can do that um and get your your family involved and your friends involved and just talk about science i always say that there's no wrong way to do science communication as long as you're communicating accurate science um so if you wanted to do science communication um even if you are younger like that doesn't matter you can still do science communication too and so that's one way that you can kind of get involved and just kind of teach people about here are sharks, here's what's happening to them. Um, that's one way to do it. I also think that another way is to just kind of focus on what's happening with the ocean and the things that you can do to help the ocean as well. Um, so like, we like to think that we're very disconnected from the ocean, but we're not. Everything will come back around. We're all very intricately connected. That's how the earth works. Um, and so thinking about what products you could potentially try and replace in your lifestyle if that's an option for you. It's not an option for everyone, but um, if it's an option for you, that's great. Like I like to use bamboo toothbrushes. I use a reusable water bottle. Um, my friend has like a not, she doesn't use plastic sponges. She uses like a, like a, a brush, like a dish brush that has like um, 
it comes with like a bar of soap and you just like rub it on the bar of soap. So it's like, she's not using the plastic bottles. She's not using the plastic sponges, like those kinds of things, like the smaller things that you can do to kind of help the ocean and limit what plastics um, or other chemicals or whatever go into the ocean. Um, again, that's easier for some people than it is for others. I recognize that, you know, some of those things seem kind of expensive sometimes. Um, and I totally get that. Sometimes I struggle to be able to keep up with that. Grad student salaries are not high, but um, yeah, sometimes the little things help. So doing the smaller things that you think, oh, like that wouldn't help anything. Um, you never know. Cause it, it really does add up. We've got a lot of people on this planet. So we've, we have a lot of people doing the small things that adds up a lot. So that's a, a definitely a, a place to start. If you are trying to like ease into your journey of like, how do I help the earth? That is so great. Thank you so much. Um, oh, wait, last one. Favorite shark. Gut answer. I know it's probably hard. Thresher shark. Thresher shark. Easy. It is a shark that hunts with its butt. That's hilarious. Okay. They're, I have someone actually made this for me. Their tail makes up like half their entire body length and they use it to like scorpion whip over the top of their head, their prey, and then they can just collect whatever's not moving. And that's really cool. Wow. Also, they look terrified all the time. So 10 out of 10 shark. Okay, everyone's gonna have to look up a picture of that if you don't know. Um, thank you so much, Jada. This was absolutely amazing, so informative, and it seems like you left a lot of people very inspired, which is great. Um, so actually, I'm gonna stop the recording and we can, uh, yay, to the shark, and we can all maybe come on our cameras.